were in, so I, I wouldn't be able to contain myself. It kind of brought back my old Jesus hippie days back in the 70s when we went out on the, on the streets of Fort Lauderdale on the beaches. Jesus, one way, man. Jesus loves you. And all these drug addicts are getting saved. Crazy. We were just crazy things we did. You know, we, we, didn't, we were just beside ourselves. We just loved Jesus, and we didn't know anything about the word. We just know that Jesus can save you. Young people are getting saved, and they're cutting their hair off back to looking real nice and groomed. Because back in the 70s, you know, they, it was a mess. They were tripping out on Fort Lauderdale Beach. <laughs> Jesus loves you. Yeah. Oh, to have that vigor. Oh, to have that exuberance, that joy of knowing that Jesus is coming soon, that he can save and he can heal broken hearts, destitute addictions, everything at the feet of the cross is completely changed. But it's time. It's time to change. Randy Skeet, anyone heard of Randy Skeet? Pastor Randy Skeet, he's currently ministering in Australia at this time. If you want to catch up with him, just follow him on Twitter. He'll give you a little note. But uh, his preaching really impacted me, and I'll share with you in a minute. But he had three things he loved to say before we started. Can you remember what they were, those who know him? Well, that was one of them. First off, he says, turn off your cell phones, distractions. Then he said, pray for me. And his prayer was, Lord, put your word in that man's mouth. And he quoted from Jeremiah. And then he said, I want you to think. And he quoted from Isaiah. Think. Can we do that this morning? Sow unto yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon Brad. This is personal, very personal. It's hard to break up fallow ground and give up something that is so deeply embedded in your childhood memory, especially when it smells and tastes so good. Oh yes, the odor that triggers my hungry, happy summertime memories, so vivid I could taste it. You know what it was? It was delicious smell of fried bacon in the morning on the Michigan country farm. And boy, I tell you, no one, nothing could keep me in bed when I smelled that coming from the banister. I remember it vividly. You know, when I smell bacon today, it was like I could see the crispiness. I could smell it. And I flew down the stairs. No one could stop me. I made sure I had enough for me. And uh, so bacon was my, all through adult life, bacon, the smell of bacon still, still engenders that beautiful memory. But the taste of bacon, hmm. Oh, the sweet bacon of my flesh. Where are you now? It was time. Why does sin smell and taste so good? Hmm? Why, did it, why is it that it's so enticing? I knew something had to change. So what changed? Well, it takes time. It took time for me anyway. I had to look in the mirror and grapple with the truth. God's word was there and allow the Holy Spirit to change a craving into a loathing. And this is the word of God that really shook me to the core. Finally, after many years, we find in Deuteronomy 14, 8, and the swine because it divideth the hoof and cheweth not the cud, is unclean unto you. Ye shall not eat of their flesh, nor touch their dead carcass. Now, Jesus had a thought about this. And we find this in Matthew 7, 6. He said, Give not that which is holy unto dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again to rend you. So tell me, what pearl of great price, what holy, precious pearl is as priceless as your salvation? Who are we 
to forget the rock from whence we are cut, the dust from which we are formed. Dare we throw away the priceless pearl of Christ's forgiveness and toss it to unclean swine, the unclean clean swine of lust and greed? If we are to stay the course of our salvation, we must redeem the time. It is time. And I knew I had to reform. Um, making a change so radical took years, slow but sure. But first, first thing I did, graduated from real bacon to turkey bacon. And then I discovered analog meats. Oh, the joy of benevolent bacon. Have you heard of that? That's a hickory smoked plant-based alternative. And now I can trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus. <laughs> Benevolent bacon, yes. Made pea protein, believe it or not. So what made the difference? It was prayer. It was the word of God. Bible study. And of course, Randy Skeet had to have a sermon on appetite. Oh, bless his heart. That sermon cut me to the core. Uh, he has a series that you can find on Amazing Discoveries. It's called The Roots of Truth. It's video, it's free. And his sermon t uh, series is based upon the first three chapters of Genesis. There's enough gospel in the first three chapters of Genesis to save souls and to reform my life because it did. Because he was talking about appetite and that really got me. Oh Lord, let it always be. Because that's when the Lord put his firm hand on my conscience and squeezed it hard and said, Brad, are you really that hungry? Oh yes. Well, today's topic is going to transport us in time back to 445 BC. And that's where we see the greatest change where people gave up a lot of things, a real reformation ever seen in Bible record. Think about it, it's autumn 445 BC, about this time of the year actually. And it was during great holiday, a high holy day in the Hebrew calendar. And this is the day the complete transformation occurred in Israel's daily lifestyle. You see, this day was very special because the sons of Israel could not celebrate it for a long, long time. If we look in Nehemiah, we find this record. Israel had been where during the last thousand years? They had been in captivity where? What country were they taken captive from? Yeah, first Assyria and then Babylon. Finally, God made a way for them to return home. They were a thousand miles from home and had been over a, a long time since they'd been able to celebrate this special holiday. He used this last four, and God used at least four divinely appointed men to stir the national conscience and inspire complete spiritual revival. They are Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, and Zechariah. These are the men that had a heart for God's word and his church. And today we're going to focus on this record found in mostly Nehemiah. And we understand that, ne that it was Ezra who recorded both his history, we find in the book of Ezra, and also in Nehemiah. And that's where we find his prayer and everything else. And that's where we're going to go to. If you want to, please turn to Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 9 through 12. Nehemiah. It's almost in the middle of your book, the last part of the history, just before Ruth. Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 9 through 12. And Nehemiah, it reads... And Nehemiah, which is the Tershatha, you know what that is? That means governor. Tershatha. And Ezra, the priest and the scribe, 
And the Levites that taught the people said unto the people, all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not nor weep. For all the people had wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto the Lord, neither be ye sorry. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites still all the people saying, hold your peace for the day is holy. Neither ye be ye grieved. And all the people went their way to eat, to drink, and to send portions and to make great mirth because they had understood, they had understood the words that were declared unto them. Now consider this, what was the spark that ignited this fiery spiritual conviction? What was it? Was it tradition or oppression? Was it holiday? What, what was it? It was reading, listening to the word of God, the law of God. And this came from the pen of inspiration from the hand of Moses. Now, let's let explore the good news. This was good news to them, very good news. These events that led to the greatest reformation that we ever have seen recorded in the Bible. This is what the good news is, by the way. This is what it is. It means that there is an answer to our sin problem, that there is a resolve that we can be forgiven, that God will then forgive and then return that gift with a gift of joy. Here's the amazing thing. Before the good news can take its appointed course, we must digest the bad news. The bad news. And the bad news is, unless we repent, we perish. The good news is God offers a substitute where none other than the Son of God himself will pay our death penalty. Our sentence is expunged. Our great advocate has taken our place and paid the ransom we cannot pay. Oh, what unfathomable mystery is this, that one should die, that I go free. Think about it, one should die, that Brad can go free and give me his joy, his strength. It's time, it's time. So let's examine Naomi's, excuse me, Naomi, what did I say? Nehemiah's gospel. We'll fly through the accounts of the first seven chapters of Nehemiah till we land on the gospel runway found in chapter eight. And then we'll take the taxi through in chapters 9 through 12, and we're prepared to launch, take off, and blast off from the Reformation runway right into the blue yonder of the gospel skies in the final chapter. Here we go. Nehemiah's gospel. Or, if you pronounce it in Hebrew, it's Neha, ne, Nehemiah. Nehemiah. That's Nehemiah. So, in chapter 1, we see that the penitent prayer of Nehemiah plants the seed of reform. News had of Jerusalem's broken walls had reached Nehemiah. He was a king's cupbearer, and he prayed so his prayer and his tears were such that he got his prayer was such that was powerful. He said to the Lord, "We have sinned, but our captivity is lesser punishment than we deserved." During the course of the event, in chapter 2, we see that his request was granted and he, had, he was sent to expect, inspect the walls of Jerusalem. So in chapter 2, he is spent expecting all the walls. He came at night. This is during the time of Artaxerxes I, who ruled Persia from 465 unto 424 BC. What was the condition of the walls when he saw them? broken down. What do walls do for a city? Hmm? Good point. They separate. 
They separate the outside, the robbers, the things that would come against you, and they, from the inside, the place of safety where the Lord dwells, the Lord's house, was in where? It was in Jerusalem. So, in chapter 3, the wall building begins. When was it destroyed? Nebuchadnezzar did it. It was actually Nebuchadnezzar II in 586. So it's been a long time since Jerusalem was laid bare, open to inspection. So the rebuilding starts during the fall of 445. Chapter 4, conspiracy. That was more than a theory. Things were going on behind his back that really disturbed everybody. And worse than that, there was shenanigans going on between Israelis. Uh, for example, the poor were forced to mortgage their corn to their own brethren. Really, really tough things going on. Then in chapter 6, there was rumors. Oh, they were saying, oh, Hebrew church, they're always rebellious. They'll never pay their taxes. They're bad people. And seven, chapter 7, we see that the city gates were finally completed, and they were well kept. How were they kept? Remember when they were building the wall, what, what was in each hand? The sword in one and the trowel in the other, or whatever else they had to build. So things got done really fast. How fast? 52 days. All that rock. Nehemiah had them all organized in groups. Wherever they lived, that's where you worked. And that's the wall that you that you've built up. And so we can, the date of this meeting in the gathering, we can accurately determine to be, by looking at comparison of both calendars, October 8th, 445 B.C. How about that? So, if you look, and you, I went to a website, and I, there, uh, Casio has a website where you can say how long ago was that? You know how long ago that was? 2,461 years, 11 months, and 21 days ago. To this day, that's when this gathering that I read about there in, in Nehemiah. And that's where we are today. Chapter 8 covers these events, that the gathering at the water gate in Jerusalem. Now, the water gate is one of many gates. You had the horse gate, you had the sheep gate. The water gate is down in the southeast corner. And that's where the priest would take water from the pool of Siloam, that's the water gate, and bring it up as a libation. We see that in John where Jesus was actually cried out and said, I, come unto me, uh, rivers of living water. But this occasion was, this occasion that is recorded in Nehemiah has a name. It's called Rosh Hashanah. So what is Rosh Hashanah? Well, according to the Orthodox Jewish website, Chabad.org, this is a special day in the Jewish calendar. It is the birthday of the universe, according to them, the day that God created Adam and Eve, and is celebrated as the head of the Jewish New Year. This is High Holy Days. It's going on as we speak. The first two days of the Jewish New Year, Tishri 1 and 2, beginning at sundown on the eve of Tishri 1, Rosh Hashanah 2018 began at sundown on September 9, just a few weeks ago, and continued through nightfall September 11. And what they do at that time, they have candle lighting in the evenings, a festive meals and sweet delicacies during the night and day, and they, pr they have prayer services, including the sound of the sofa. What's the sofa? It's a ram's horn. And they, they blow that so far in the mornings, and they desist during creative work. It's a, high, it's a high holy day, and it's a Sabbath week. No work, nothing whatsoever. This high holy day in the Jewish calendar is the modern context of this gathering in Nehemiah at the Watergate. They still celebrate it today, this gathering. It's called Rosh Hashanah. So we find in this chapter, chapter 8, that Ezra and his colleagues read the word of God to all the people. It's a special time because it was a time where, as, as I just read, even today, where the, read of, the word of God is read. We find in Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 5 through 6, it reads thus, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people did something interesting. What did he do? They stood up, the Bible says. 
verse 5 reads, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Verse 6, And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Your quick three lessons that we can take to heart here. These, these two verses. The word of God requires our reverence. We must remove ourselves from the seat of ease and stand before an almighty God, both as just judge and justifier of a repentant sinner. Next, the word of God requires our recognition. We must realize his word is true. This is the meaning of amen. When we say amen, we're saying what you say is right. Next, the word of God requires our response. Here we see their response. That means our face of pride must bow to the ground of humility. The face of pride must bow to the ground of humility. The following verse in verse 8 of chapter 8 of Nehemiah reveals the work of a prophet. It reads, So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. Read that again. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the meaning. That's the work of a prophet, a preacher, or anyone who presents the word of God. But here in this case, many of the remnant of Israel did not understand Hebrew. They had been so mingled into the traditions of Persia, they had forgotten the tongue of grace and truth. The wine of Babylon had clouded their conscience and reduced their piety to a pile of pebbles. Now, we can focus on the heart of renewal. We read again in the following four verses here, verses 9 through 12 of chapter 8. This is, for me, the real heart and soul. And Nehemiah, which is the Trishatha, the governor, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep. For all the people wept. They heard the words of the law. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions of them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto, you, unto your Lord, Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites stilled all the people, saying, Hold your peace, for the day is holy. Neither be ye grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth, because they had understood the words that are declared unto them. Let's pause to consider this. What is the joy of the Lord? What is it? Any thoughts? What is the joy of the Lord? Have you thought about that? Because he says here, the joy of the Lord is your strength. It encourages us, and then we must understand what the joy of the Lord is. Here's my quick answer. The joy of the Lord is the Lord's joy in securing your salvation. The joy of the Lord is the Lord's joy in securing your salvation. Think about it. We find in Luke 12, 7, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth 
That's verse 10 of the same chapter. Christ overcame the shame of the cross by embracing the joy of the Lord. Christ overcame the shame of the cross by embracing the joy of the Lord. We find in Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. What is our strength? That's the next question, right? What is the joy of the Lord? What is our strength? Isaiah 12, 2 reads, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He has also become my salvation. What is our strength? What is our strength? According to this word, he is my salvation. Therefore, our true strength comes from untainted trust in the transforming power of Christ's joy. His joy was the sight of your salvation. Christ saw me on the cross. Think about that for a while. He saw you as the nails tore through his flesh. And he rejoiced to see this day. It's time. Time to bring him a broken heart. He will heal. He will cleanse. That's the joy of the Lord. And that's our strength. You see, tears of repentance is the wellspring from which Christ cleanses his bride in the fountain of salvation. Tears of repentance is the wellspring from which Christ cleanses his bride in the fountain of salvation. A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Song of Solomon 4, verse 12. Oh, may our tears of repentance be sealed and shut up in the garden of Christ's love and mercy. In Proverbs 5.15, we read, Drink waters out of thine own cistern, and running waters out of thine own well. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad, and rivers of waters in the streets. Let them be only thine own, and not strangers with thee. We must never forget the cost of our salvation. The life of one who loved you dearly, even while you despised him. Oh, how I ran from God. You know, I could never hide. He always found me out. He always found me. Thank God he never gave up. Thank God he never gave up. Salvation and joy are intimately bound by the marriage covenant relationship between Christ and his church. Salvation and joy are intimately bound by the marriage covenant relationship between Christ and his church. Here, Isaiah 61.10. Isaiah 61.10. Isaiah 61.10. It reads, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. 
The church is the bride of Christ, robed with the garments of praise and with joy of salvation. Does the Lord love to sing in the midst of his nuptial joy? Does he sing? Does the Lord sing? Hmm? Well, here's something to consider. Zephaniah 3.17 reads, Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Does my God sing over your salvation? Psalm 32, 7 is even more powerful to, my, to me. We discussed this last Wednesday meeting, our prayer meeting time. Psalm 32, 7. Psalm 32, verse 7. Psalm 32, verse 7. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Songs of deliverance is compassing us this morning from on high. Praise God. Think about it. Think about it. All heaven will sing if we but bring the broken strings of our heart. He will repair the cords of despair and bring forth a song of deliverance. Yes, the Lord sings over your healed heart. Amen. He sings over your healed heart. And we move on. We move on to chapter 9. This is Ezra's mighty prayer. This is where he declares the truth. It's time. It's time. And we see in these two books, Ezra and Nehemiah, four major themes. God is sovereign. Sin separates. Obedience to the word of God. And penitent prayer. God's sovereign. His kingship controls every circumstance. That was what our Sabbath school lesson was about. Even though Paul was shipwrecked, God used every circumstance to bring the kingdom of God to many who were lost and had no hope. Sin separates. God's people must be separate from sin. Obedience to the word of God is our primary purpose. Penitent prayer will bring Reformation power. So let me read three sections here of Ezra's prayer. They go into a heart-rending, powerful consideration. Here's one of them in Ezra 9.6. So this prayer is recorded slightly different in both books, Ezra and Nehemiah. So they run in parallel sometimes. It reads, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee. My God, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespasses have grown up unto the heavens. And next, in verse... Ezra chapter 9, verses 13 through 15, he continues and cries out, And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that thou art God, that our God has punished us less than our iniquities deserve, and has given us such deliverance as this, should we again break thy commandments and join in affinity with the people of these abominations? Abominations, abominations. Wouldst not thou be angry with us till thou hast consumed us, so that there shall no remnant nor escaping? O Lord God of Israel, thou art righteous, for we remain yet escaped as it is this day. Behold, we are before thee in our trespasses. We cannot stand before thee because of this. And finally, we find going back to Nehemiah 8, 36 to 38. His prayer reads, 
Behold, we are the servants this day. For the land that thou gavest unto our fathers to eat, the fruit thereof, and the good thereof, behold, we are servants in it. And it yieldeth much increase unto the kings whom thou hast set over us because of our sins. Also, they have dominion over our bodies and over our cattle at their pleasure, and we are in great distress. And because of all this, we make a sure covenant and write it. And our princes and Levites and priests seal unto it. Does this indicate, excuse me, does this indictment describe the church today? Think about it. It is time. It is time. We see right here what Nehemiah is talking about. They're talking about the covenant. They're going to write it. And who is, according to this, in verse 38, it says, Our princes, who else? The Levites and the priests and all the congregation will seal their name to it. Has anyone ever taken an oath? Ever taken an oath? Uh, I made an oath before the Lord standing there before my pastor and my bride. I looked Sonia in the eye and I said, Lord, at the exclusion of all else, I take you to be my wife. I swore before the Lord. Here's another oath that happened later on. It wasn't quite expected, but um, the circumstances allowed us in our family where the army was a good option. And so when Sonia raised her arm and swore an oath to the United States Army and to the Constitution of the United States, believe me, it, me it means something. When you do that before Almighty God, if you leave without permission, what happens to you? If you leave the army without permission, you're absent without leave. When you make that oath and you join the army, who owns you? Uncle Sam owns you. Why else do they call a GI? Government issue. You are property of the United States Army. Nehemiah and the congregation swore an oath. It's the same object. They swore, we belong to you at the exclusion of all else. And if, there any, and if we ever, ever desert you, whatever comes upon us, we desert. Whatever iniquity comes upon us, whatever it is, we ask for it. And I believe it still rings true today. It's time. Consider this. The fruit of reformation is transformation. When Sonia raised her arm and swore at oath, her life was transformed from a civilian to an officer in the United States Army. There's no joining of the two. Doesn't Paul warn Timothy not to be entangled in the affairs of civilian life? What does that mean? What does that mean to be entangled? The distractions. So there is the change, that transformation. Your life is totally transformed. The fruit of reformation is transformation. Old understandings are hard to overcome. For me personally, back in the day I had a real problem with the law, the law of God. And I, Psalm 119 just was a mystery to me back then. Uh, my Roman Babylonian background recoiled at, at a thing that was supposed to have done away with at the cross. How could anyone say, oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day, as we see in Psalm uh, 119 and 97. But finally, almost 10 years ago, 
with a broken and contrite heart while meditating on Leviticus chapter 11 I found the law my delight and could say with affection great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them yes verse 165 by the way and my transformation continues to this day there's a lot of work that needs to go on in this in this heart and so we come to chapter 10 we find that the covenant is finally signed and sealed we get a list of everyone who was there Nehemiah is very very concise I thank God for a man of God who does these things there's no way that anyone of those people on that list could ever get away from the vow that they made and the oath that they had taken before God and this is some of the things that they had pledged to do look about this in chapter 10 they pledged to know and understand God's will they pledged to walk in God's law they pledged not to intermarry hello they pledged to keep the Sabbath sacred they pledged to generously provide offerings and tithes and they pledged not to forsake the house of God we must not forsake these duties today because they're still valid they're still valid and then in chapter 11 we see the, the suburbs and Jerusalem repopulated by the remnant the remnant the remnant the remnant Jerusalem is being repopulated by the remnant just as a prophet declared 70 years ago from that date we read Jeremiah 31 verse 7 Jeremiah 31 verse 7 and 8 listen to this for thus saith the Lord sing with gladness for Jacob and shout among the chief of the nations publish ye praise ye and say O Lord save thy people the remnant of Israel behold I bring them forth from the north country and gather them from the coasts of the earth and with them the blind and the lame the woman with child and her that travail with child together a great company shall return thither right there yes a remnant will return from the north country of contention and strife and sing the song of salvation in the great company of his church the prophet Joel says almost the same he says in chapter 2 verse 32 Joel 2 verse 32 and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord has said and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call deliverance from self-reliance self-will self-worship start by calling upon the authority and the majesty of his name what is the name of a name above all names what's his name what's his name say it Jesus Jesus there's no other name by which men must be saved no other authority no other love than Jesus in Greek we pronounce Jesus 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 the J is an I which means anyone have a clue what does Jesus mean Jesus means Jehovah saves or Jehovah is salvation Jesus there's no other name to call upon deliverance comes only by calling on the name of the Lord by his grace a remnant will be saved will you be counted among them will you Romans 11:5 reads Romans 11:5 Even so then at this present time also there is a 
remnant according to the election of grace. We must consider how our commandment keeping and our testimony taking will rouse the enemy's wrath upon Christ's remnant seed. It's going to happen. What does it say in Revelation 12, 17 about the remnant? Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Are you his seed? Her seed? Which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of who? Hallelujah. It's time. And so we find in chapter 12, the priests and the Levites are given their tasks for service. And finally, in chapter 13, records the climax of the church's reformation and transformation. The church is commanded to separate themselves from the mixed multitude of Babylonian and Persian thinking. A detestable, leprous lifestyle that separates us from God. Think about it. First, uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 17. 2 Corinthians 6, 17. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. There's a warning and a promise. A warning and a promise. I was driving Tyreek to school there at Harvard Hills, and he was wondering about all these things about why don't we touch this, and why is it wrong to do this on the Sabbath? He always, he's very concrete. He's 11 years old. You know, everything is literal. And I asked him, See that red sign there that's got eight sides to it? An S-T-O-P, what does that mean? So, oh, stop. You know, stop. It's so, okay, yeah. Well, why did someone put that there? So he, Tyreek said, well, because they want you to stop. So, oh, really? Think deeper. Why, did the, why was the sign put there? What do you suppose would happen if you just ignored the stop sign? So, well, I might get hurt. Or maybe I'll get a ticket. Okay, Tyreek, time to think deeper. What was the real reason you're not supposed to, you know, that, that that stop sign is there? Well, he gave up. Huh? What was the real reason? Your safety. Your safety. That's the spirit of the law. When the Lord says, touch not the unclean thing, it's for her own good. The Lord knows us. He knows what, what danger lies out there. He doesn't want to give you a ticket, but he sure will if you offend it, right? Why? Because he's protecting you. And maybe we'll learn, maybe I'll learn my lesson and not go so fast next time. Because there's these little blue lights that kind of remind you that the law of God still stands. Also consider this, um, leprosy and swine are both biblically unclean. Have you thought about that? The pigs and leprosy, the skin disease, are both biblically unclean. Those who cling to the swine of Babylon and the leprosy of Persia will fail and they will fall. Dear Lord, spare us, spare us. In Isaiah 21.9, we read, Isaiah 21.9, And behold, there cometh a chariot of men with a couple of horsemen. And he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and all the graven images of her gods he hath broken unto the ground. There's another place that is very familiar. Revelation 14.8. Revelation 14.8. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, 
that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. You see the thing? Does, law, does the Lord want to save us and keep us from these things? Yes, he does. He promised he will receive us. Touch not the unclean thing. The, the wine of the wrath of fornication. In the great controversy, page 475, verse, uh, paragraph 2, it reads. It's a great controversy, page 475. Paragraph 2. The world is given to self-indulgence. Let that sink in. The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life control the masses of the people. But Christ's followers have a holier calling. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And she continues, In the light of God's word, we are justified in declaring that sanctification cannot, cannot, she says, be genuine, which does not work this utter renunciation of the sinful pursuits and gratifications of the world. Let me read that again. In the light of God's word, we are justified in declaring that sanctification cannot be genuine, which does not work this utter renunciation of the sinful pursuits and gratifications of the world. It's time. It's time. Isaiah 52, 11. Watch it. I'm getting excited. Depart ye, depart ye. Go ye out from, from thence. Touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. Are ye bearing the vessels of the Lord today? I believe Timothy is one of those vessels. As Ilde caresses his son, the most precious vessel we could ever carry. This is what he promises, those who carry the vessels of the Lord. Revelation 18, 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not her plagues. It's time. It's time. And I, myself, I had to closely examine one of my favorite holidays and place it into the light of Bible truth. Little did I know back then how dark it was. Do you know what I'm talking about? About this time of year? Hmm? At the end of October? What happens? at the end of October in most places in this country. What's it called? It's actually All Hallows Eve. And it's a Romish superstition that believes that before the Day of the Dead, which is November 1st, spirits come out of the grave and visit homes and they, live, they leave little treats or they play little tricks. And this was brought home to me when I lived in Dominican Republic and I visited a friend's gravesite. I didn't know any better, I was just being a friend and reaching out to a Catholic friend. And on November 1st, in the Catholic nations to this day, they go to the gravesite, clean off the leaves because they don't have a, you know, it's a poor country, they don't have fancy places. And light a candle for a dead loved one so that that dead loved one would be at peace. That's All Hallows' Eve. That's Halloween. And boy, when I was young, as a young parent, did I enjoy taking my little ones to go out trick-or-treating. I'd dress up Rosalinda like a little angel. And little Daniel, he was a pirate. I'd use Mama's mascara to draw a beard on him. They look so cute, you know. Oh, it's, it's harmless. It's harmless. So cute. Oh, today the churches, you know what they do? They have truck or treat, you know. They, they dress you up in little things, you know. Harmless? Excuse me? Consider. Consider the inspiration of all these. So, 
participating in these dark occult practices never occurred to me. It never did. But I had a day of reckoning, and it was the Word of God again that convicted me and convinced me of my folly and my sin. But I paid the price. Because my kids are still don't go to church. You see, it's important how we care for these sweet, precious vessels that are put before you. And you may not be a mother, but you may have young ones that are put in your charge. It's important to understand that the things we do to them will have eternal impacts. Lord, forgive me. Lord, save us. Lord, save us. The temple has to be purged. It's time. It's time. And so, as we follow in this chapter, the temple is finally purged. There is this guy named Tobiah who, who used one of the special meeting places for prayer for his personal closet and it had to be cleaned out. All the junk, the personal baggage of Tobiah was tossed in the garbage. So much filth. It all must be thrown into the Valley of Kindred. Ki Kidron. You know what that is? What's the Valley of Kidron? It's the outskirts of Jerusalem. It's also known as Gehenna. Did I say it right? Gehenna? That's the trash dump where this eternal fire was burning. And that's where we must throw the garbage of Tobiah, the, in, the distractions that keeps us from prayer and clean out our whole of the temple of God. Then sacred Sabbath was to reformed, was to be reformed by the whole church. That means no personal selfish pursuits were permitted. The Lord's Sabbath must become our delight. And the chapter lists several things that he did. He even went to the gate of the city and closed them. The next, and this may be tough for some of us, all mixed marriages had to be annulled, divorced. All Israel was warned of the, hor the horrific dangers of being unequally yoked. Look at jo uh, Joshua 23. Here's the warning. Joshua 23, 11 through 13. Joshua 23, 11 through 13. We find. Take good heed therefore unto yourselves that ye love the Lord your God. Else, if you do in any wise go back and cleave unto the remnant of these nations, even these that remain among you and shall make marriages with them and go into them and they to you, know, here's a warning, know that for certainly that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you and scourges in your sides and thorns in your eyes until ye perish from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you. It's time to divorce ourselves from the lust of the flesh, pride of life, the vanity, and prejudice. Prejudice must be purged. So I say there can be no salvation without reformation. There can be no salvation without reformation. Page 468, chapter 2, in the great controversy we read, the law of the Lord is perfect concerning the soul. Psalm 19.7. Without the law, she says, Men have no conception of the purity and holiness of God or of their own guilt and uncleanliness. They have no true conviction of sin. Thank you. And feel no need of repentance. Not seeing their lost condition as violators of God's law, 
They do not realize their need of the atoning blood of Christ. The hope of salvation is accepted without a radical change of heart or reformation of life. This superficial conversion, excuse me, thus, superficial conversions abound and multiplies. Excuse me, let me start over again. Thus, superficial conversions abound and multitudes are joined to the church who have never been united to Christ. Let me read that again. Thus, superficial conversions abound and multitudes are joined to the church who have never been united to Christ. My dear family, it's time. It's time for the remnant to be revived and reformed. You know what that means? It's time to leave ungodly associations, to put away ungodly habits, to put away ungodly toys, to put away ungodly Sabbath distractions, to put away ungodly wives of pride, prejudice, and selfishness. It's time. It's time to put on Christ, to put on the fruits of the Spirit, to put on the joy of the Lord, to seek the Lord while he may be found, to become more like Jesus, living in piety, honesty, and generosity. Is that not who Jesus is? Is that how we should live? It's time. It's time. 1 Peter 4.17. 1 Peter 4.17. For the time has come. The judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, What shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? It's time. It's time. You may not have had to deal with bad food, broken faith, or barren festivals as I have. But God continues to convict me of my personal follies. It's time to forsake the bad, the broken, and the barren, and seek the Lord while he may be found. If the ground of your faith suffers the famine of doubt, discouragement, or discontent, then it's time to let God break up your fallow ground. It's time to consider your ways And let your only strength be the joy of the Lord. Amen. As we prepare to sing the next song, I challenge you to think about when you sing this song, hymn number 292. And perhaps you yourself would be challenged to, to respond to the call to come out from among them and be separate. It reads, Jesus, I come out of my bondage, sorrow and night. Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come. Into thy freedom, gladness and light. Jesus, I come to thee. (laughs) Out of my sickness, into thy health. Out of my want and into thy wealth out of my sin and into thyself. Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come. Our Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for keeping us, saving us when we come before you with all honesty and brokenness. Yes, Lord, there will be a remnant Oh, but how few there were. 
let us be counted among them, dear Lord. As we consider with great joy the exuberance of young people around this world, from Japan to Nigeria to Illinois, that they are indeed coming to you, lifting up their voices and saying, Jesus is coming soon. It's time. It is time. It is time to say, Jesus, I come. And so we do, Lord, as we thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day, a day of rest that you have offered us. Allow us, O oh God, in the remainder of this time to offer ourselves in his service. As we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.